I wonder, please, if you have your Bible with you this evening, if you could turn to Exodus chapter 11. The book of Exodus, the 11th chapter, there's just the 10 verses in the chapter, and we'll read from verse 1. Exodus chapter 11, reading from verse 1. And the Lord said unto Moses, Yet will I bring one plague more upon Pharaoh and upon Egypt. Afterwards he will let you go hence. When he shall let you go, he shall surely thrust you out hence altogether. Speak now in the ears of the people, and let every man borrow of his neighbour, and every woman of her neighbour, jewels of silver and jewels of gold. And the Lord gave the people favour in the sight of the Egyptians. Moreover, the man Moses was very great in the land of Egypt, in the sight of Pharaoh's servants, and in the sight of all the people. And Moses said, Thus saith the Lord, About midnight, Will I go out into the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die, from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sitteth upon his throne, even unto the firstborn of the maidservant that is behind the mill, and all the firstborn of beasts. And there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as there was none like it, nor shall be like it any more. But against any of the children of Israel shall not a dog move his tongue against man or beast, that ye may know how the Lord doth put a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. And all these thy servants shall come down unto me, and by down themselves unto me, saying, Get thee out. And all the people that follow thee, and after that I will go out. And he went out from Pharaoh in a great anger. And the Lord said unto Moses, Pharaoh shall not hearken unto you, that my wonders may be multiplied in the land of Egypt. And Moses and Aaron did all these wonders before Pharaoh. And the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, so that he would not let the children of Israel go out of his land. Well, in the reading, there at the last verse of the 11th chapter of Exodus, knowing that God will add his blessing to the public reading of his own precious word. Many times as we read through the message of the Bible, we are struck with certain verses of Scripture that on the surface don't seem logical or most significantly seem out of context. Our Scripture reading brings us to such a verse. And in verse 3 of Exodus chapter 11, we read, And the Lord gave to the people favour in the sight of the Egyptians, Moreover, the man Moses was very great in the land of Egypt, in the sight of Pharaoh's servants, and in sight of the people. And these words come to us in the aftermath of nine of the plagues that descended upon the Egyptians. It was a very challenging time, a bewildering time, a catastrophic time, uh, for that African nation. And it was very much observed that Moses was the man who made his entrance into the Pharaoh. And therefore it was understandable uh, that people would come to the conclusion uh, that the influence of Moses uh, was strong and powerful in this situation. And one therefore would come to the conclusion and that instead of thinking Moses uh, to be very great in the land, in the sight of Pharaoh's servants, and in the sight of the people, that it would just be uh, the opposite. 
And yet the Bible does tell us, when a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies eh, to be at peace eh, with him. And just for a very few moments this evening, I want to draw your attention eh, to what I believe are the reasons behind eh, this wonderful eh, revelation of Moses in the midst of a catastrophic situation, a calamitous environment eh, to be distinguished as a man who is great in the sight of Pharaoh's servants and in the sight of the people. And the first thing that strikes me is the undermining of Egypt's idolatry. It is important to keep in mind uh, that each plague that was inflicted upon this nation was a direct response uh, to the various segments of their idolatrous uh, practices. In light of which, I, I must make what I consider to be a significant statement in my appreciation of God favoring his people. I say it within the context that the so-called religious life of this governing nation, when biblically dissected before the people, left them uh, totally disillusioned and ready to consider the contrasting blessings enjoyed by the Israelites. In other words, all that they had been commanded to follow was nothing more or nothing less than a false religion uh, that was parlous, that was perverted, that was the personification of evil. Uh, thus the ten plagues were not a form of judgment uh, distributed in a way that was haphazard or thoughtless. This was God at work, highlighting the fundamental differences between truth and error. By taking each plague in turn, I desire just in a very brief way uh, to demonstrate uh, that God was systematically dismantling uh, the influence of religious ritualisms uh, that promoted a rejection of the true God and a revolution against any who would testify of his existence. I, like any other like any other unbiblical ideology, the Egyptians sought to defend the indefensible with an air of pride that fed into the egotism that attempted to cancel out any feeling of insecurity. So it was clearly revel relevant that the first plague publicly exposed their shame. Fundamental to their devil-inspired beliefs was an adversity to blood. So when their sacred river Nile was turned into blood, it instantly generated a loathing and a detestation for that stretch of water that a few moments before had been a major part of their worship. The result of this calamity was confusion and shame. And when the priests of the people failed to reverse the situation, a significant dent was made in their perceived reputations. We should keep in mind, however, that less than 100 years before, the Pharaoh then had commanded that the Jewish male children would be thrown into that river. So the first plague was taking a major block out of the structure of this false religion. The second plague centered upon the release of frogs from their swamps to invade their bed bedchambers, their houses, their beds, their ovens, as well as their food. This dealt with the issue of their superstition. 
Frogs were consecrated to one of the Egyptian gods and used by the priests as an emblem of divine inspiration. In this they assimilated from the swelling or the expanding of the amphibians' throats. But to the followers of this god, this apparent revolt of the frogs immediately turned them uh, from being an illustration of heavenly communication into a cavalcade of obnoxious slime. This made it impossible for those who venerated such creatures to raise them again to the level of linking the heavenly with the earthly. This was a major blow to the peddlers of false religion. No longer would many of the people listen to the stupidity of their ecclesiastical leaders. Their days were numbered. They would soon be out of favour. I trust that you see a pattern here. When false religion begins to lose its grip on the people, then God opens up a way for his faithful servants to proclaim the blessings of reformation. The third plague was the flesh-clinging lice. This was a reminder of their sensuality. The idolatries of Egypt were accompanied with rites and ceremonies that were among the most unclean and the most abominable found anywhere in the world at that time. Yet such performances gave the outward appearance of an external cleanliness that deceived and deluded the worshipper. This displayed itself in the garments that the priests wore. They were particularly cautious about any sign of lice or defilement being found in their robes. And yet they had no scruples about using young girls for their perverted desire for sensuality. Now that every part of them and their people were covered in lice, they could no longer maintain even a semblance of outward purity. And in a practical way, it checked their vile longings for the abuse of the innocent. It remains a very sad fact in my understanding of things that idolatry often breeds immorality. We have seen it in this nation. We have seen it in this country. And yet priests who have been found guilty of such acts of evil have not been excommunicated, but have been facilitated. One of the greatest missionaries from Northern Ireland was a lady called Amy Carmichael. And whenever she took up residence in an Indian district called Donovar, she challenged the abuse and the misuse of young girls in the Hindu temple of that area. In other words, she challenged their sensuality. The fourth plague was with regard to their sacrilege. That is the plague of flies. As strange as it seems, the people were taught to revere these despicable insects. In fact, the god of Ekron in 2 Kings chapter 1 is depicted as a fly deity to his people. And in Egypt itself, the ancient archives record that oxen were offered in sacrifice to these aggravating beasts. So this plague of flies degraded their venerated deity to such an extent that the people's respect for what they had hitherto believed was now being challenged with a serious question being considered. And yet we should never forget 
that such is the subtlety of the devil. He will convince the wisest of men that their God is a fly. There are Hindu people tonight in this world who worship a fly for their God. The one and only true God must and will demonstrate that he is the creator and not the creature. <coughs> the fifth plague confirms their separation. It was a common belief that many animals were the habitat of one of their many gods. The lion, the wolf, the dog, the cat, the goat, the ape were considered to have certain deities residing in them. But the one animal that was viewed with special veneration was cattle. The belief was that the soul of the god Osiris lived in cattle. And so when this plague struck these bovine, it demonstrated that this so-called god was nothing more than the figment of their imagination. <coughs> and to compound their deepening spirit of confusion, uh, there was the line of separation between the cattle owned by the Egyptians and those owned by the Israelites. It was impossible for Pharaoh's people not to see the difference. And the more they could see the difference, the more they were being prepared to show favor to the Israelites when the time came. The next is the plague of boils, which deals with their sacrifice. We learn in Egyptian historical detail that when there was an outbreak of a physical disease, the priests led the people to appeal to what they called medicinal divinities. And in an effort to solicit their favourable intervention, they sacrifice living people by burning them on the high altar and then casting their ashes to the winds that their atoms may overspread the land, falling on the people and producing healing for the disease that afflicted their citizens. On this occasion... Moses took ashes from the furnace and cast them into the air. And when this dust descended upon the priests and the people, their skin was covered in boils. This is the first plague that touched the fleshly sensitivities of the people. And the priests could do nothing about it. This added to their already developing bewilderment and with God preparing them to act in a favourable way to his people, the idolatrous structures of Egyptian religion were on the verge of breaking. The seventh plague brings us to the agricultural section of the nation's hope for survival, that is their sowing. I have found on some visits that I've made to the African country of Kenya that after a hailstorm or after any type of storm, whether it be rain or just wind in itself, it affected the maize crop of the land. In fact, when I saw one particular field recently, it seemed to me that a massive number of people had entered the field and had deliberately trampled the stalk into the ground. Now in Egypt, it seldom if ever rains, and a shower of rain, of hail, would be a phenomena. And added to the hail was rain and the fire. So when this plague was poured forth, it devastated the wheat, 
the barley, the flax, the flax and the other plants that had been cultivated for either food or trade. The effect was devastating. All their effort in sowing and tilling was in an instant destroyed. And the ground that was so fertile in Joseph's day was unable to, to yield its fruit. But there's an aspect of this that can't be ignored. With no natural produce to sell, the people's finances would be drastically reduced and the contribution to the priests would all but cease. In other words, this plague would not only expose the bankruptcy of their faith, it would bankrupt their entire religious system. Whereas God's people were still sowing and still reaping. Their shame, their superstition, their sensuality, their sacrilege, their separation, their sacrifice, their sowing. But there's also their supplies. We've mentioned the rain and the hail and the fire. But now the land is attacked by locusts under the command of their creator. Any vegetation that survived the previous plague was now devoured by swarms of the most destructive insects known to man. The days when Egypt was the breadbasket for the nations round about have been catalogued in the annals of history. But now the unavoidable consequences of famine cast a shadow over its people. A nation that thought it was master of the universe, who at a time happily accommodated the Lord's people, had changed its attitude to the people of God, treating them as slaves in a manner that was exceptionally brutal. But in reality, it was the Egyptians who were the slaves. Let me, however, add this point. A nation's long-term survival, by way of its worldwide influence, is dependent on how the people of God are respected. Not because of who we are in and of ourselves, but because we've been chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. Our nation was a great nation when men like William Carey were going across the world bringing the gospel, or W.G. Grace, or David Livingstone. Our nation was great then. Because our nation respected God's people. That respect over the years has diminished greatly. And so has the greatness of our nation. The penultimate plague was darkness. And it is interesting to observe this is their source. The Egyptian philosophers taught that all deities and their various gods were conceived in the darkness of the night. Hence the people were taught to worship the dark. And this made darkness an important ally to those who extrapolated from it mysteries which could not be proven or disputed. With deception that was intimidatory, they used the darkness to authorize their pernicious teachings and to conceal their perverted tactics. An old Egyptian song summarizes their thinking on the subject. I will sing of the night, the parent of the gods and men, night the origin of all things. Then the plague of darkness struck. It was a horrible darkness. A darkness that they felt. 
and over which their gods had no power. In real terms, it signaled the notional death of the darkness as the conceiver of man, and so called gods. <coughs> this was the undermining of their idolatry. But then just very briefly, there is the undertaking of the enlightened instructor. We read here, moreover, the man Moses was very great in the land of Egypt, in the sight of Pharaoh's servants, and in the sight of the people. I like that expression, the man Moses. This is not a denigrating term. It is not a diminutive term. Rather, it is used, I believe, to assure us that a mere man who is enlightened by God the Holy Spirit can be made the mouthpiece of God and can be raised up even in this nation uh, as someone who would be a voice even as the voice of Moses uh, that would be as an enlightened instructor. Uh, and I say this from the very depths of my heart, if ever there was a time we needed an enlightened instructor in this nation, it is now. We do not, we do not have an evangelical voice in this nation that the people will listen to. There's not one. When Dr. Paisley spoke, people listened. I would like to have heard him in Westminster in recent days confronting the situation that faces that mother of parliament. But God can raise up someone else, a man, a woman. And of this man, Moses, we learn that he was meekness characterized in humility. He was a very meek man. Above all men which were upon the face of the earth, And that immediately establishes the principle that meekness of character is not a bar to effective and fruitful ministry. God does raise up his Elijahs, whose personality seems to be carved from rocks of granite. But he mercifully enlightens his Elishas, of whom it could be said, Thy gentleness hath made me great. And in the case of Moses, as he saw the dismantling of the idolatrous practices of Egypt, he was the one that God looked to, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit and that trembleth at my word. But he was also a messenger characterized in harmony. What the Lord said to him, he spoke. He was not ambivalent or <clears throat> subject to equivocation. When God said something to him, even though it was bringing him right into the very courts of power. He wasn't hesitant. He didn't say, I have to think about that. He said what the Lord said to him. And the reason for that is very simple. That the people may know that there is none like unto the Lord our God. But just one final thought, and that is the unfolding of the everlasting identity. Whenever I read this chapter some 
a few days ago, and I'd read it many times. I hadn't really thought of this particular point, <coughs> that the people were to speak in the ears of their neighbours and ask them for jewels of silver and jewels of gold. You, you think about that just for a moment. They have suffered the dismantling of their religious system. And now the Israelites are going to this people who are now religiously bereft. And they ask them for their gold and for their silver. You, you can see how this is unfolding. Because the time would come fairly soon whenever there would be the tabernacle in the wilderness, the silver would be needed for the brazen laver, the, the, the laver, the silver laver, there before the tabernacle. And then you'd have the gold for the various other parts of the tabernacle. But there's one thing missing. They didn't ask for brass. And is there not a message there? Gold in the Bible speaks of God's glory. Silver speaks of redemption. And brass speaks of judgment. And just the next day, the blood would be applied to the door. And the blood would be their judgment. And they could leave under the precious blood. To me, that's the real message of the gospel. When I, the Lord, do see the blood, I will pass over you. Yesterday morning, I, along the little pathway that I, I walk. I, I met this Anglican minister that lives quite close to where we live. He, he's just been ordained. We entered into quite an in-depth conversation. But at the centre of our conversation was this issue. Do I follow tradition or do I follow truth? And he was advocating tradition, percolating the conversation with such thoughts. And I asked him if he could quote me a text of scripture for what he was saying. He said, I'm sorry, I can't. And I said, I didn't ask that to offend you. I asked you that just to show you that there is a major difference between tradition and truth. And I fear tonight there are dear people who sit in our congregations who maybe feel, because we are traditionally free Presbyterians, that that makes us ready for heaven. Would to God it was true, but it's not. You and I could be catechized and brought up within the free Presbyterian church and sadly still go to hell. And I trust tonight that we have sought, though in great weakness, to present to you how that those plagues in, in Egypt, they, they were not just to bring pain and suffering to the Egyptian people. It was a challenge to what they believed, and it was fine one thing.
and accept you're born again of God the Holy Spirit. Redeemed through his precious blood, you'll be found wanting in the day when you leave this scene of time. And that could be today. So we invite you, in the Saviour's name, to receive him. To accept him into your heart. For as many as receive him, to them give he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. For all that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. Thank you for listening. Thank you for making the effort to come along this evening. I know that God will in you will look forward to your own pastor being with you next Sunday and I will look forward to that as well <coughs> but I trust that tonight if you hear his voice you will harden not 